So we are in a series, as you, I'm sure you know, that we're doing for the month of February. It's called Love is a Battlefield, and it is, you know, February is the month of love and all that good stuff, and we did this series last year as well, and we're kind of continuing the series this year with uh, some more sermons based on the, uh, looking at the biblical concept of relationships, not just romantic relationships, but all of our relationships that we encounter on this earth, and really enjoyed it. I've been really challenged this month myself just in even preparing these and preaching these sermons, so I pray and believe that you guys have been encouraged and challenged as well. Uh, we're in week three, and uh, I want to jump right in this morning and give you the text verse for today. In fact, if you would please stand with me as we read God's word together out of 1 John chapter 4. It says, Dear friends, that's all of us, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. It's very important that we remember that. We are living through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. Beautiful passage of scripture today. Uh, you know, the first couple of weeks we've talked about uh, loving God and loving and caring for ourselves. and if you haven't figured it out yet, today we're gonna be talking about loving others. The title of my message today is God's Love in Us. Would you pray with me this morning? Our gracious, wonderful Heavenly Father, we love you today. We thank you so, so much that we can come together like this as a body of believers coming together to worship and to hear from your word. Lord, I pray that the seeds that are planted today in our life will germinate and produce in our lives. And it will not just be a fun time we have together, but it will affect us as we leave this place today, God. Be glorified in our midst. Do your work as only you can do, God. We promise to give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. amen. God bless you. You can be seated. So if you've been here or listened for the first two weeks, you know that we've been talking about, as I said, loving God and loving ourselves. And you, we've talked about the fact that the catalyst for that love in those two relationships is in response to God's love for us. You know, Jesus said that you're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, with all of our being, right? But he did that in showing us that it was a response to what he has already done for us. I realized when he said that, he hadn't actually gone to the cross yet, but he had already, through the history of the world, shown his love to us as the human race in many, many ways before he ever said that we are to love him with all of our being. And so we are loving because of God's love for us. But today what I wanna do is, as we continue this journey we're going through this month, we're talking about loving God, loving ourselves, and now loving others, we're gonna see that it's, it's more than just loving in response to God's love for us. When we love others, it's the love of God in us, flowing through us into others in our life. That's the passage that I just read. It's all about the fact that God's love is in us. See, because what God is telling us, or what John is telling us through, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is that we need God's help to love others, amen? I mean, we'd like to think we don't, but we definitely need God's help to love others biblically, to love others the way that he has called us to love. And what, we're, what he's saying here is that everyone else gets to experience our expression of our love to God because we're going to love others because of that love in us. Basically, the people that we are in relationship with get to reap the benefits of our relationship with God. That's a beautiful thing, that they get to reap what God is sowing into us. He's helping us to love others, to love everyone else. In fact, my verse, my text, one part of it says that everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Now, you might hear that, and that might be a little bit of a head-scratcher because as a, you know, a, a surface, cursory reading of that, you'd think, well, no, not everybody that loves has to love God. I mean. You know, an atheist mother can love her child, right? So what is he trying to tell us here? He's saying you can only love if you know God. And that word know there is the, is the Greek word that means a very intimate love 
or in a very intimate knowing. It's not a casual. Um, in some places, that same word in the Bible is used as a relationship between a husband and wife. So it's a very intimate type of knowing. And he's saying, John is saying, if you're really gonna love people, you have to know God in that intimate way. And to, to understand this, you have to understand what he's talking about here when he talks about love. Love is mentioned a lot in my text verse today, right? Every time that word love is mentioned, it's agape love, which many of you probably heard that term. You might even know what it means. Uh, just a quick Greek lesson. <laughs> I'm not equipped to teach Greek, but I can tell you this much. Uh, in the Greek, there's four words for love. In English, there's just the one, love. And we translate four different words in the Greek to love. One is the passionate, intimate love between a husband and wife. One is the love you would have for a family member, a, a child or an uncle or something like that. Another one is the love you would have for your friends or your peers in life. And then agape is the love you have for mankind. It's the, it's the love you have for everyone. It is the sacrificial love. It is the loving someone without expecting anything in return. This kind of love can be extended to any human being on the planet. Whereas the other three are specific to a certain type of relationship you have. Agape love is to everyone. It can go towards anyone that you would be in relationship with in the world. So what John is telling us here is that to agape love people, biblically, sacrificially, without expecting anything in return, like God has intended for us, the only way to do that is through a personal, intimate relationship with Jesus. It's pretty simple. And he's saying it's not even just about having that relationship, but it's also the fact that we have this relationship with God and it's his love in us that overflows, pours out of us into others. He's saying you can't do it on your own. You just cannot do this kind of love on your own. He says if we love one another, God lives in us. So he's saying basically the love of God in us is what's gonna help us to love one another. So in, in, we're adding to what I've been talking about the last couple weeks that it's about responding to God's love for us. Now it's God's love in us that is actually helping us to do what he's called us to do. Now we're still responding to God's love for us when we love others too. That's part of it because in fact John says here that because he loved us we ought to love others. So that's definitely part of it but he doesn't stop there because we know you know, we'd like to think that relationship, loving others, is really just this really easy thing, but it's, it's actually a big battlefield in our life. You know, we're talking about love as a battlefield. One of the biggest battlefields in life, anytime you love others. We would like to think that, you know, the arena or the platform where we are in relationship with other people in life is in a field full of daisies where we're frolicking around and everything's just dandy, and we're just talking about how much we love each other and how easy it is to sacrificially love everyone, and we're doing it over coffee and apple pie, and everything's just wonderful, and it's a storybook ending all the time. But the reality is, it's a battlefield. The reality is, it's a challenge in our life. In fact, the, the world, society says, all is fair in what? Love and war, right? Even society knows that it's a challenge, right? Because in war, the comparison there is actually ridiculous to think that we would compare relationships to war. But that's really, there's some similarities in our, in our natural self. Because in war, it's all about protecting yourself. It's all about covering yourself. It's about making sure you win and you don't get a lot of damage in that situation. That's how a lot of people approach relationships. That's how we are all prone to approach relationships. Unless God is in us. That's the only chance we have. And the beauty of it is, is he says, I will help you. I am in you, I will do this with you if you will allow me to help you. It doesn't have to be about self-preservation or just doing whatever we gotta do to win in relationship, but it is about the agape love that he would call us to. I wanna just make sure I clarify and reiterate this today. You will never ever love other people in your life, whether it's family, spouse, friends, coworkers, you will never love them consistently with an agape love apart from God, cannot do it. It is a losing battle, you will never ever win it. You might have short-term success, but long-term it'll never work out without God in your life. That's what he is here for. Paul, uh, John says in that passage, he says, we can't see him, but if we love, he lives in us. I love this. You don't have to see him with your eyes to be able to have him in you and love the way that he loves. So this, what this tells me is that one of the reasons 
that God puts his spirit in us is for this purpose. You know, last week I talked about being filled with the spirit. You know, the importance of being baptized in the Holy Spirit and continually filled with the spirit of God, right? That's so important. And it, it, it's, if we're not careful, it can become something for us where it's just about us. Like, oh Lord, fill me with your spirit because I need to have a good attitude today. Lord, fill me with your spirit because I need your emotional healing in my life. Lord, fill me with your spirit because I need your blessing. I need your anointing. I need provision. I need, I need, I need, I need. That's part of it. There's no doubt that that is part of the job of the Holy Spirit in us, but that's only part of it. It is also to be that that he would fill us to overflowing so that we could love others the way that he has designed for us to love others. It's so easy for us in the church to have this us against the world mentality. And we can circle the wagons, you know, and say like, we're the church and we gotta make sure we're taking care of ourselves. And that is scriptural. We're supposed to build up the body of believers. But that's not all we're supposed to do. This thing of circling the wagons and just staying together and not trying to let anybody else hurt us because, you know, we're the church and society is so against us now and everything's horrible and thank God we have each other. That's not how it's meant to be. In fact, I heard a, I heard a preacher say not too long ago and this is somewhat of a crude analogy, so bear with me here, but um, it, 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 it's appropriate, and it feels like it makes total sense when I read it, but he said that Christians are actually like manure. <laughs> now, this is a Christian that said it, so he was not making fun of Christians. He said Christians are like manure. If you spread us out, we can actually really help things grow. We can actually be really fruitful and do a lot of good around us, but if you keep us all in one big pile, we just stink. <laughs> I mean, that's, there's some reality there. There's some truth. I promise you're going to remember that analogy too, aren't you? That's probably all you're going to remember from today. You're going to be talking tomorrow about this sermon. Like, I don't remember anything you said except that I'm like manure. But it's so good for us to remember that, that we are not just meant to just be recipients of the Holy Spirit so that we can just soak in our Holy Spirit hot tub and just take it in and just, ah, thank God for that warm, hot tub, bubbly water but we are meant to take it and impact our world, impact the lives of people that God has put in our life. We are meant to be effective for the world, amen. Praise God. Let's not get out of balance and think that it's just about us. Our love relationship is for everyone. There is people that God has put in your life that he is wanting you to love in that way, to let the spirit of God flow through you into the lives of others. And we can resent, re- reject it, we can push it aside and not think about it, but the reality is we have to be intentional about it. And so what I wanna give you today, I wanna give you a few points of what the, this battlefield of agape love looks like. Because if we're gonna do this in our life, we are absolutely going to have resistance when we try to live this way. Because it's not in our nature. My text verse made it very, very clear that without God in us and without us submitting to him, it's not even possible. So of course your enemy is not gonna sit by and just let you do it. And your flesh nature is not just gonna sit by and let you do it, it's gonna resist. So I wanna make you aware of a few of the battlefields that I think will encourage you and challenge you today. And the first one is the battlefield of nice versus kind. Now if you were here last year, I actually preached a whole sermon on nice versus kind, and it was, I believe, one of the most well-received messages of last year, really. A lot of really positive feedback because there's it, there's some illuminating that this does in our life. And, um, but today, it's just gonna be one of the points. I'm kind of condensing it, but if you haven't seen the sermon, you can go back and watch it on, on our website or YouTube or something like that. But uh, the idea is that it's easy for us to kind of use these words interchangeably. Like, what's the big difference between nice and kind? I mean, they're not opposites. They both have to do with how we treat other people, right? But the difference is that one is pretty superficial and the other one has more depth and intentionality to it. So let me give you some descriptives to kind of help explain what I'm talking about here, okay? So let's start with nice. First of all, nice is much more superficial, okay? Nice is just kind of easy and superficial to be nice. One of the descriptives would be polite. You know, somebody that's nice, you would, all, you would say, oh, they're just really polite. You know, they, they, it's holding the door for somebody as they're going into a building or letting people in in traffic, you know? That's, that's really nice, except for the people that are behind you that are getting annoyed, but you know, it's, it's nice to let people in and, you know, you say please and thank you and you're welcome and just always very polite. That's, that's part of being nice. Also, pleasant and peaceful is about being nice. You know, smiling a lot, not, not rocking the boat, kind of going with the flow. You know, just being really peaceful, just 
pursuing peace at all costs and avoiding conflict, you know? By the way, society loves the polite, peaceful, pleasant Jesus. Everybody loves that Jesus, right? But that's only a part of who he is. Another part would be positive. Being nice is about being positive. You know, that, that person just has positive energy. They're just so nice. They're always looking at the bright side, you know? And, and to the extreme, you know, they'll avoid anything negative and ignore it and act like it's not even there if we, if we take it to the extreme. And so positive is part of being nice too. Okay, so now let's look at kind. Kind is more in depth. Kind is more intentional. Kind is about being caring. Not just, oh, I care and being sympathetic, but actually your actions follow your heart where you actually do something to show that you care. It manifests in your life. It's also about conviction. Having conviction in life, being kind, is about standing on your convictions. Knowing them and standing on them. And doing things that would reinforce your convictions in life. And that it's also about character. It's about doing what is right even when you could get away with not doing what is right. It's about having integrity which goes to having your convictions and standing on them. The bottom line is, nice is easy, kind is gonna cost you something. That's the biggest difference. Nice is just not rocking the boat at at any cost. Kind is actually doing the right thing in the moment and making sure that we're actually displaying the love that we say we have for people. Nice is society's utopia, you know, where everybody's just polite and pleasant all the time there's no conflict and everybody just, you know, it's almost like there, there's some families that, that you'll see like this where everybody's just nice and, you know, they're like the husband and wife haven't fought in 15 years, but you can just see the seething frustration between the two of them, but they're just determined to be nice no matter what, but not really dealing with anything. That's, that's society's utopia, that we would just all be really nice, that, that we would not, you know, that we would be the nice Jesus, but that we would never bring our conviction. Society doesn't want to see the conviction we have in our faith. But conviction is important because loving others the way God would want us to, to do it well, sometimes is going to be unpopular. And it's not just about being nice. And people will resent the kindness of God, the kindness of the principles of faith, because the gospel is offensive. Now, here's the deal, church. I know I feel like I say this a lot, but I think we always need to be reminded of this because there is a lot of pressure in society and even in the church to some degree to just make the gospel nice. But the gospel is offensive. Well, listen, let me read Romans 2. Romans 2, 4, it says, do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you toward repentance? It is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. The kindness of God is his truth and his mercy combined, right? That's the kindness of God, and it leads us to repentance. Can I tell you, church, anything that leads us to repentance is offensive. It's all in how we respond to it, okay? Everything about the gospel is offensive because everything about the gospel goes against our sin nature. So it's always gonna offend us on some level. Now, some of you may have been maybe really seasoned in your faith. You've been a Christian for 40 years and the the, the tenets of the gospel don't really offend you. That's great. I think that should be, that's a goal we should strive for, you know, that it would just be easy for us to just say, yeah, you know what? I'm nothing on my own. I just need Jesus, you know, and to come to that realization, that's wonderful. But there's always, we never get to the place where there's nothing about the gospel that doesn't offend us. Never. Because it's always going against our nature. So for us to be led to repentance, something had to offend the norm. That's exactly what the gospel does. And nice without kind is not really adhering to the tenets of the gospel, okay? Now I know some people would say, oh good, I'm just gonna go around and offend people, woo, here we go. That's not what this is about at all. We don't purposely offend, but we have to love people in such a way that you heard the analogy before, like, nice is if, like, somebody's drowning right here off to the side of you. Nice is saying you'll pray for them. Kind is actually pulling them out, right? Nice is like, oh, I don't want to offend the person, you know, because, you know, I don't know how they feel about me reaching down and grabbing their arm. But kind is really about being more concerned about 
the bigger picture than just in the moment. And there's always gonna be tension because it's always easier just to be nice. For all of us, every one of us. But we are called to a love that would exemplify kindness. In fact, there's some verses, I want, a couple verses I wanna share with you out of Philippians 2. This verse exemplifies kindness. It says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. That is kindness. Nice is just saying, God bless you. Kindness is doing something about it. Nice is saying Jesus loves you. Kindness is actually showing them that Jesus loves them. Nice is easy. Kind is going to cost you. And then Jesus takes it even a little further in his words in John 15. Look what he says. He says, my command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. That's some intense stuff from Jesus. So how are we supposed to love? It says, love others as I have loved you. What does that mean? Well, he goes on to say, no greater love than to lay down your life for your friends. Now, me as a pragmatic, I look at that and go, wait a minute. Now, am I supposed to literally die for everybody? I can't do that. Jesus is the only one that could die for everybody, right? So what's he talking about here? He is, he's not talking about literally dying. He's showing us the mindset that we should have in relationship with others. That like, man, if, it, if, if that's what it took, I'd lay down my life for it. That we would, that we would approach it in such a way that it's, we're not approaching relationships about what we can get out of it, but what we can give to it because of the love of God in us. Because of how he loved us, we are to love people that same way. That's what being kind is. And it's much more than just being nice. And it's a tension we're gonna fight in our life forever. All right, let me give you the second one. The second point is forgive versus resent. You know, you can't talk about loving others without this. Uh, I feel like we, we talk about forgiveness quite a bit. You know, and when we, we plan out the year, we plan out our, our sermon series and we plan out our messages, like one of the things at the top of the list all the time is we gotta make sure we're keeping the concept, the biblical concept of forgiveness in front of our people because it has to be kept in front of us all the time because it is not our nature to forgive unconditionally, to, to make it a priority in our life to make sure we're always forgiving. Yet when the disciples came to Jesus in Matthew 6, and said, Jesus, teach us how to pray. Like Jesus could have said anything in the world at that moment, and what he said was very clear. It was about worship, it was about forgiveness, and it was about surrender. That's what the Lord's Prayer is really about. He says, forgive my sins as I forgive others. And it's so interesting because people will recite the Lord's Prayer and not even realize what they're saying. What you are saying to God is, hey God, use the measure that I forgive others in my life to choose how you're going to forgive me. That's what you're saying. Forgive me as I forgive others. Forgive me, God, just like I forgive everybody else in my life. Not just the ones that deserve it, but all of them. Even the ones that don't deserve it. And forgiveness is such a challenge. It is so, <laughs> it can be such a challenge to stay up to date on forgiveness if we're not careful, right? I was, I was thinking about this this week and I thought about, you know, my phone alerted me yesterday, I think, or two days ago, that I have a software update on my phone. And that, to me, is very similar to the concept of forgiveness in our life. Like, it's constantly reminding me, you know, it'll just, the screen's blank, and all of a sudden, boop, it'll pop up, say, you haven't updated your phone yet, you know? You need to update it. And we, uh, sometimes we just don't do it, right? Because we're like, well, I just don't wanna really deal with it, it's gonna make my phone go, go, go kaput for a couple hours, and I may not want that, or, you know, I know it'll probably work better if I do it, but I'm kind of used to the way it is, and what if it changes my apps? God forbid it logs me out of some of my stuff and I gotta try to find my passwords, you know, and you just kind of delay it and delay it and delay it. My last phone, I think I delayed it for two years. I just wouldn't do it, because I knew as soon as I did it was gonna crash my phone, right? And I think that's how forgiveness is in our life. It's like the Holy Spirit's reminding us, like, hey, you haven't really forgiven that person. You haven't really let that go. You haven't really extended the forgiveness that I've given you in your life, and we just put it off. Even though we know it would be better if we do it, we kind of get used to this toxic comfort zone that we're in. And like, I just don't know if I can deal with having to go there and really extend and be intentional about forgiving that person because they haven't asked me, they don't really deserve it, they really hurt me, and they're just going on their merry way, and here I am hurting. But God would say, 
always that we never, ever, ever have the right to hold resentment. And it's not just that we don't have the right. What he's trying to do is put us, set us up for success, set us up for what he wants to do in our life. Colossians 3, verse 12, it says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. Okay, that's us. Paul's saying, this is who we are. We are God's chosen people, and we are dearly loved by him. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. So he gives us the why and the how here. Why do we forgive? We forgive because the Lord forgave us. How do we do it? I'm glad you asked. He says, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Clothe yourself. It's interesting that all these qualities are things that we would, would um, put into relationships. Every one of these things. Compassion is in relationship, kindness, being humble, gentle, and patient. All of these things are things that are aspects of relationship with others. And he's saying, clothe yourself with these things. Now, what do we know about clothing ourselves? One version, I think, says, put on these things. One thing about clothing ourselves that's the same for every person around the world, no matter of your, your financial status, no matter of your, your nationality, your gender, your race, your age, we all have to put our clothes on. They don't put themselves on us. You might have help but somebody's gonna put those clothes on. We all have to put our legs in our pants. We all have to pull our socks up. We all have to put our shoes on. We all have to do the things that we have to do. No matter how much you want it, no matter how hard you pray for it, no matter how hard you believe in it, you're never gonna wake up in the morning and your clothes just come out of your closet and put themselves on you. Now that'd be sweet if they did, especially on a Sunday morning for me. I can promise you that, I'd love it. But it doesn't do it. We gotta do it ourselves. And what this verse is telling us because how many of you know the Bible is intentional? Like, the, Bible, the Holy Spirit didn't inspire people to just write stuff, but you know what, I think it would sound good to say clothe yourself here. Let's do that. It's intentional about what it's telling us here that we have to be intentional to put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And we do that, if we sit, that sets us up for success to be able to forgive each other as God has forgiven us. Forgiveness is not just about doing the right thing because it's the right thing. We have to have a revelation that forgiveness is about freedom. It's about freedom in our life. And I know in a room this size, I know that I know that I know that there's many of us in this room that are struggling with this very thing because every new day seems to bring a new reason to have to forgive somebody for something. Social media will do it. Watching the news will do it. Going to work will do it. Going to school will do it. Sharing a house with a spouse will do it. Having kids will do it. Friendships will do it. There's every relationship has potential to have to extend forgiveness on a daily basis. And some things are small. Some is just the, somebody snapping at you for something little. Some can be incredibly traumatic and horrible. But we have to, if we will set ourselves up and understand that us forgiving is about freedom. For us, it changes everything. You see, God forgave you to set you free. What makes us think that us forgiving is any different? He forgave us to set us free, so he asked us to forgive so that we can stay free. Because you know when you don't forgive, you're the one in bondage. You're the one that's struggling. You're the one that is missing out on so much of the blessing of being in relationship with Jesus. You know, I... Uh, I love to watch some crime documentaries. It's just kind of what I do. I mean, in downtime, it's kind of a way for me to just turn everything else off in my brain and just watch something. I like to kind of watch the process sometimes. And, you know, I've been trying for 20 years to get Joy to do it with me. She just won't do it. She just doesn't understand how great it is. And, uh, <laughs> and so I, I watch these things. And, you know, it's, it's just amazing to watch some of the situations. And I remember one specifically where... Uh, a teenage girl was actually kidnapped and, and murdered by some guy, and it took them years to catch the guy. They finally caught him, and they prosecuted him. He was convicted, he put in prison, and by the time this documentary aired, or this story aired, it was probably 10 years old of what had actually happened. And 
they, I, I remember the interviewer was talking to the dad of the teenage girl. And again, it, it had happened like 10 years earlier. And they were just asking you know, how he's coping and how he's doing with everything. And, and um, he looked at the interviewer and he said, you know, I'm a Christian. He said, and I know exactly what the Bible says about forgiveness. And I know that Jesus forgave me for all of my sins. But he said, I just can't forgive this guy. And it just, it broke my heart to see that because I could tell you before he ever said it, I could have told you because they were interviewing him and he was saying, saying other things earlier. You could see the pain. You could see the anguish. You could see the bondage that he was in to the situation. Now listen, nobody, I, I can't even begin to fathom what that man has gone through. I, it's on a level that I could never ever, hopefully will never ever understand. And I get that. But here's the thing, church. Here's the, here's the hard truth about the gospel. God cannot overlook our resentment because he feels sorry for us. He can't do it. He's, he won't allow himself to do it because he has set a standard. And if you look at Matthew 18 and the story of the unmerciful servant, you see that no matter what happens to us in this, on this earth, there's nothing that could happen to us that is any, any, even close to requiring the amount of forgiveness that God had to extend to us. And he says, if I have forgiven you for all that, you have to forgive others. But it's not just you have to do it because I said so. It is about freedom. Because I've also seen crime documentaries where it's happened and the person has said, I forgive the person that did this. And I've seen where people have actually gone to the prison to face the attacker, the person that did whatever they did, to tell them, I forgive you. Because Jesus forgave me, I can forgive you. And the countenance of the person is completely different. So it's not, a, it's not a matter of what has happened, it's a matter of understanding that the only way to really get freedom is to live this out in our life. And I know some of you are struggling with that. I know some of us, it's easy for us to, to feel like and, and go to the idea that it's just not fair. You know, when something happens and then whatever happened, that person didn't, isn't even sorry, hasn't asked my forgiveness, hasn't tried to reconcile and it's just not fair. I, I, hope, I hope we know this and I hope you know my heart when I say this, but we gotta get off this whole fairness thing. Life's not fair. It's just not. There's nowhere in the word that it tells us that anything on this earth is going to be fair in life. And the reality is, this is another hard truth, but we really don't care all that much about fairness unless it affects us. I mean, that's the reality. There's so much going on in the world. There are atrocities happening all over the world every day. Christians, too, getting martyred, getting imprisoned for their faith, and you hear about it, but, and we, you know, we see it, we go, oh, that stinks. But we don't really do much about it. And if we really cared about fairness, we would dedicate more of our life to it. But the reality is it's human nature to really only be outraged about unfairness if it's happening to us. And the reality is we can't focus on fairness. Let's focus on freedom in our life because that is what forgiveness brings us in our life. Luke 17:1. Jesus said to his disciples, things that, uh, things that cause people to sin are bound to come, but woe to that person through who they come. So Jesus is telling us here, listen, people are going to do things to you. Don't worry about the fairness part of it. Jesus will take care of them. You need to just be careful in how you respond. I can tell you, we're going to be held in account as to how we respond to the sins that have been perpetrated against us on Judgment Day. We're going to be held to account how we respond to the things that happen to us. Jesus is gonna deal with the people that bring it. He says, woe to those who bring those sins into our life. Woe to those who bring those offenses into our life. It's not our, it's not our place to make sure they get what's coming to them, right? And the reality is you're not letting them get away with it when you release, when we forgive. I know what changed my life in, in regards to forgiveness a long time ago was having a revelation of the concept of that it's, it's not about letting them get away with it. What's happening is what I mentioned earlier in my message today. They are reaping the benefits of your relationship with Jesus. That's what's happening. And that's gotta be okay with us. They're actually they're getting the mercy and grace because of our relationship with God. Not because I'm good enough that I can suck it up and deal with it, but it's because of his love in me flowing through me. And church, I don't care what has happened to us, that is possible with the Holy Spirit in us. He does not ask us to do it alone. He is going to do it with us as we submit ourselves to him. 
All right, third and finally, the battlefield of honor versus exploit. Now, exploit is a, you know, it's a really negative term. We hear it, it's got a negative connotation to it, but the, the bottom line is exploit is just really to use in a selfish way. That's what exploit means. And in the context of what we're talking about today with relationships, it's about going into relationship for what we can get out of it, right? And I know we would, you know, we would gasp at the insinuation that I would just be about what I can get out of relationships. Well, the reality is it's, all in, our, it's in all of our wheelhouses. You know, you might have moments where we're wanting to give sacrificially, but without the Spirit of God helping us, we are all going into relationship for what we can get out of it. We are all looking to exploit relationships in our life, apart from the Spirit of God, apart from the love that we talked about in my text verse today. And in contrast, honor is about respect. It's about coming into a relationship with respect. It's about adhering to what is right, to honor the Word of God in our life, in our relationships, adhering to what is right. This is God's way of approaching relationships. In Romans 12, verse nine, the New Living Translation, it says, don't just pretend to love each other. That word love there again is agape. So don't just pretend to agape love. Don't just pretend to sacrificially love each other. Really love them. I think the New King James says, love without hypocrisy. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. In other words, don't just talk it, walk it. That's what the Word of God is challenging us to do today. It says, hold tightly to what is good. You know what that implies? That implies a battlefield. You gotta hold, anything you gotta hold tightly to, you don't have to hold tightly to my clothes. They stay on me. What I gotta hold tightly onto is the leash when I take my dog for a walk, especially if she sees a squirrel or a bird. Then she's taking me for a walk, right? You gotta hold tightly because if you don't, it'll get away. It's saying hold tightly to what is good because it is trying to get away. We have to hold tightly to honor because honor is not something that comes naturally. Now it does, it's easier when it's somebody in life that we feel deserves it. You know, if it's a good boss, if it's a good teacher, if it's a good parent, if it's somebody good in our life, it's easier to honor them. But unfortunately, the Bible doesn't just tell us to honor the good people in our life. In fact, Peter tells us to honor, he, he's exhorting the Christians back then to honor the king. And the king during this time was Nero, who was a butcher who was killing Christians as fast as he could kill them. Yet he says, honor the king. So everybody is due honor in life based on the scriptures and based on the word of God. And see, what we do is we honor God when we honor others, when we could exploit them. And it is all about honoring God. In fact, when I was preparing this, it reminded me of the story of uh, Noah. You know, everybody knows the story of Noah and when he built the ark. That's what he's known for, right? Well, there's another story about Noah that isn't told quite as much. It was after they came out of the ark and they started to replenish the earth. Noah planted a vineyard and he made some wine and it says that he drank too much of his wine and he was passed out naked drunk in his tent. And one of his sons, Ham, comes into the tent and sees him. And what does he do? He runs to his other two brothers and is exploiting his dad. Basically, hey, you guys gotta come see this. Dad is naked in the tent. This is quite a sight. Let's get our cell phones and take some pictures. Uh, <laughs> and so the two other sons come, Shem and Japheth, and instead of walking in and looking, you know what they did? They turned around, walked in backwards, took a sheet, and draped it over their dad to cover his nakedness. Wouldn't even look at it. They honored him. They covered his shame. And you know what? That's what we're called to do, too. We're not called to exploit, we're called to honor and help cover people's shame, even if they would have deserved to be exploited. Noah would have got what he deserved in our eyes. It's like, well, how dumb can you be to do what he did, right? But yet the sons honored him, and you know what happened when Noah woke up and found out what happened, you know what he did? He blessed those two sons, and he, he, he spoke a curse over Ham, who, by the way, Ham was the father of Canaan, and if you know the story of Canaan, Canaan is where the Israelites went into to take over when they came out of Egypt and destroyed all the people in there, most of them, and took over their land. And what is so interesting about this story 
is that when we talk about Noah, everybody talks about this man of faith. God spoke to him. He built an ark because God said he was going to flood the earth with rain. Nobody even knew what rain was then. It had never happened. It had never rained on the earth at this time. Incredible man of faith builds this ark. But then he makes this horrible mistake later. Nobody even talks about it. Yet Ham, all he did was kind of mock him and ridicule him and exploit the situation. What we learn from this is that Ham's response to the sin brought more trouble than the sin itself. Noah's, sin, Noah's not even known for this sin that he committed. Yet Ham's response to this caused him more trouble than it even did Noah, who was the one who perpetrated the, the act in the first place. You can learn something from that. God takes honor very, very seriously. And he calls us to honor each other in life and to, and to honor his word in approaching relationships with other, not to exploit, not to just come into relationships for what we can get out of it, but to live a sacrificial type love for others, an agape type love. And then he also goes on, Jesus tells us that we're to love our enemies. You know, Noah wasn't Ham's enemy. And that was a tough situation, but Jesus is going another mile, another length to say, not only do you need to honor people that you care about, you need to honor your enemies. I mean, who does that? Who loves their enemies? Like, apart from God, I don't see how that's even possible, you know? When we're in the, the flesh as a, as a Christian and not really willing to really give this to God, the best we can hope for is just to kind of ignore our enemies, right? Like, block them on social media so you, at least you don't have to see when they buy a new car or something, right? That's the best we can hope for, but... Jesus says, no, no, I want you to love them. I want you to honor them in such a way that you are loving them. And the reason that he could tell us to love our enemies is because he did that to us. Romans 5 tells us that we were enemies of God. But yet, while we were enemies, Jesus still came and died for us. And because he did that, he says, now I want you to go and do the same. Imagine how we could impact the world if we loved our enemies, if we agape loved our enemies and didn't just ignore them and just kind of hope they go away, but really love them the way God has called us to love them. And see, the way we can do this, because it seems like an, a Herculean task, right? Like how in the world can I do that? Everything in our faith, church, everything in our faith, every command from God, every blessing from God, every provision of God comes from putting him first in that situation. So you wanna be able to honor your enemies? You know what you do? You honor God. When we honor him, he gives us what we need to be able to honor our enemies. If you want the blessings of God, bless God. You wanna see his will done, you lay down your will so his will can be done in, in your life. Everything about this life of faith is about putting him first. And you know the areas you don't have him first because those are the areas that we control. Those are the areas where we struggle. Those are the areas where we have a hard time letting go. But everything we give him first place, he in turn empowers us. It, that, is about, that is what being filled with the Spirit is about. It's about giving him first place. It's about emptying yourself of yourself. You know, I love John the Baptist's words. I love it. I say it all the time. I pray it all the time. I must decrease. He must increase. Now, at that time, it was, Jesus was on the earth and they were, they were coming to John and saying like, hey, Jesus is baptizing over here. Didn't that tick you off? Because you're baptizing too. And he's talking about like, I want to go into the background and let Jesus come into the foreground. But that works for us today too. Even though Jesus isn't walking on the earth, when I say less of me, more of you, it's about everything in my life. God, let you be first in it. Everything. You're first. It's not about what I can get away with. It's about what I can lay down for him. It's not about how much he'll put up with with me having a, a my own, it's about, God, what is in my heart? Like, the, like David said, God, search my heart. See if there's any offensive way in me. If there's anything in me that is keeping me from giving you first place, God, deal with it. Help me to deal with it. Everything in my life, there's nothing that I would want to hold back from my God. I'm not trying to see how much I can get away with or how much I can do before I really make God mad. It's, God, what can I do to just be less of me? Because there's no way to live what we're talking about here, this agape love, without that. You're not going to be able to forgive people that hurt you unconditionally without the love of God in you. 
You're not gonna be able to be kind in the way God has called us to be kind without his love in you. You're not gonna be able to honor people that don't deserve it without his love in you. And that love in you does not flourish and thrive and flow through you unless you're putting him first. It's the, it's, that's the only way it'll work. And it's not saying one time, like, okay, God, I put you first. Can we go on our way now? It is every day. It's every five minutes of every day. I mean, it is, it is all the time. I was, I mean, I told Joy yesterday, I was, I was in my fields yesterday here at the church because I was, it was, I was going through this whole thing where I was just struggling for a minute. And man, it's just, it's the same thing every time. It's the same thing every time. And you would think after a while, you would, it would click quicker, you know, but sometimes it feels like it just takes me a while. Maybe I'm just slow and dense. But it, like all of a sudden yesterday at one point, it just clicked. It's like, oh yeah, that's right. It's not about me. Man, why can't I remember that? Because we're human beings. Because there is always, always a drive in ourselves to have our way and not just want his way all the time. Laying ourselves down is a constant laying ourselves down. But he is so good, he is so faithful, we have to remember to, to put him first and not put the cart before the horse. Not asking, you know, God bless me and then I'll be able to forgive. God bless me and I'll be able to honor. God bless me and I'll be able to be kind. He says, no, I've already given you my spirit. Live it out in your life. Live it out and you will see the manifestation of the spirit of God in you in powerful ways that so many people never get to experience because they're, they got it backwards. We have to remind ourselves that all the time. Praise God. Would you stand with me, please, and I'll close. God is good. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I want to pray. And I, I want to invite you. If you want to, you're welcome to come to the altar. I encourage you to come up front here. As I said last week, there's, there's nothing magical about a, the front of a stage, but there's something about responding to the word of God that does something in our heart. I believe God honors that, too. You don't have to come up, but I definitely are welcome to. And even if you don't come up, I want to pray for all of us. I encourage you to respond in some way to let God know that, yes, yes, God, I want to, I want to trust you in this. I want to give you everything. I want to approach relationships in my life with this agape love that you have called me to. To be kind in the, in the biblical way of being kind, to forgive and to honor. So let's pray together. Would you pray with me? Father, we love you today, God. We thank you for your word. We thank you that it is life to our bones. Lord, your word challenges us, though. It's offensive to our flesh. God, we don't want our flesh to win. I pray, Lord, that your spirit would rule and reign in each one of us everyone under the sound of my voice, God, that we would surrender who we are, we would give you everything, that we would give you first place in every area of our life, Lord, that, that our will would be your will, that our purpose would be your purpose, that our life would be your life. Lord, I thank you that you've brought people into each one of our lives, relationships into our lives for us to be effective for your glory. God, I pray that you would bring to our memory, to our minds, even now, people that you have strategically put in our life. Maybe we didn't even see it before, but that you have put in our life so that we could let them experience God's love in us. Lord, the only way we can do it is by you. The only way we can love the way you've called us to love is through your spirit. So God, would you fill us again today? Fill us to overflowing in Jesus' name. We give ourselves to you today, God. Lord, we thank you because we know that when we fall short, that when we are not faithful, that you are still faithful. Great is your faithfulness. Jesus, you are still enough. And we thank you for that today. Lord, we're thankful today that when we confess our sins, that you are faithful to forgive us. So Lord, we lay it all down today. We confess that we have fallen short. God, we will continue to fall short all the time. But we thank you that it's not about works so that no man can boast, but it is by faith through your blood. We thank you for that today, Jesus. We love you. We honor you. We glorify you. We praise your holy name, Jesus. You are the only one worthy of our praise. You are worthy of our lives, Lord. You are worthy of it all. King Jesus, 
worthy of it all. We bless you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen, amen. Praise God. Thank the Lord. Yes, praise God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. We serve a good God.